Well, it is so good to see everybody this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, as we continue our journey through the book of Philippians. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Have you ever heard this phrase? Surely. Surely. No, never, never. (laughs) Well, growing up playing sports, this is a phrase that I was very familiar with. Now, the point is not that I would ever play a perfect game, but the purpose of this phrase was to remind us, remind me, or remind anyone that in order to progress at my sport or whatever you are doing, in order to progress, I would need to be willing to put in the work. I would need to be willing and able to put in the work in order to progress. Now, this is no different than anything we do in life, than anything else we do in life. If we want to progress in our careers, we need to be willing and able to put in the work. Maybe you want to be the boss one day. Well, you need to be willing to start at the bottom and make your way on up to the top. Maybe you want to be a business owner. You need to be willing to perfect your craft. You need to be willing to build and master your craft and put in the work. Maybe you want to progress as a student. Well, you need to be willing to make certain sacrifices uh, and put in the work to excel in the classroom. Maybe you want to uh, uh, progress in motherhood. Well, you need to be willing and able to learn and work, uh, to learn your child, learn various parenting tactics that work for your child. If you want to become a professional athlete, guess what? I promise you, you need to be willing to put in the work. You see, in everything we do, in order to progress, we have to be willing to put in the work. And most of us do. Most of us are. We have a goal. We know where we want to be. And then we put our hands to the plow and we get to work to reach that goal, to obtain that goal. And this is true of most people. Most people are willing to work, to put in the work, to achieve their goals, to get better at their craft, and to progress in what they do. However, from my own experience, what I know of myself and what I know of others as as I have observed others, this type of mentality, this type of mindset does not always transition over to our spiritual life. We're willing to put in the work in, 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 at, at our jobs, willing to put in the work to excel and flourish in our homes, in our schooling, etc. But oftentimes, as it relates to our walk with Christ, we are too guilty. We are, we, are, we are guilty of coasting, not putting in the work to progress in our spiritual lives. Maybe we lean on a prayer we pray. Maybe we lean on a baptism or our eternal security being solidified because we uh, repented or had this moment where we believed in Christ, but we never take it any further than that. We just leave it there at that moment. We do not always view our spiritual lives as something we can progress at. We don't always view it as something we can work at, we can grow in, we can learn more about and excel as we do in other areas of our lives. It's almost like we accept our get-out-of-hell-free card, and then we go nowhere beyond that. We just leave it there where, where it's at. And if we're honest this morning, this is a problem that plagues the American church, the whole church. All, all churches are, are met uh, with this same issue. We fail, if you will, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling as we sit on the sidelines and coast by. We're all guilty of this at different seasons in life, no doubt. But this is not the life that Christ has called you and I to. He's called us to a life beyond that. This isn't just the life he's called us to. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, Christ did not call you to a life of casual coasting through your spiritual life. You're always, we are always progressing. Christ has called us to a life in which we are always progressing in our spiritual journey. We are always moving forward and we are always growing on our spiritual journeys. He's called us to a life of working out our salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, Christ did not save us to sit. He saved us to work. He did not save us to sit. He saved us to work. You see, we use this language quite often. Uh, the human life cycle to illustrate our spiritual journeys. And we get this from Scripture. The Apostle Paul, in his writings, he uses the language of infants and of spiritual milk 
to, uh, in order to characterize certain Christians who are not progressing. But this is not what you and I have been called to. We've been called to so much more than this. We've been called to grow. We've been called to progress and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling for the glory of God and for the betterment of his church. That's what we've been called to do, you and I as Christians. This is what we see in today's text. And this is what we want at the forefront of our minds as we walk through the work of God in these two verses this morning. The call to work. The call to work. Work is a pre-fall thing. Adam was created to work, and you and I as Christians are created to spiritual work. And so with that in mind, would you stand as we read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. The Word of God reads, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Pray with me. Father, we are in your get been recipients of your grace and mercy because of this time that you've allotted for us. God, we've gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We've gathered to look at your word. We've gathered to worship. We've gathered to sing. We've gathered to know more about you and what you've called us to do. God, we gather to be changed by your spirit that is at work within us. And so, God, as we approach your word this morning and what you have called us to as Christians, would you use this for your glory, for our sanctification, molding us more into the image of Christ? We're grateful for your grace and mercy. Speak to us this morning, God. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So the last two Sundays, we spent our time in Philippians 2, 1 through 11. And within this section, 1 through 11, we were introduced to the divine and human natures of Jesus, his sacrificial death on behalf of his people, and the state of exaltation in which he ascended to following his resurrection. And the truths that have been introduced by Paul have been introduced not only for the sake of developing theological knowledge, if you will, of who God is and what he has done for his people and the work of Christ, but in order to promote obedience and to promote humility within the Christian life and the life of the church. And so the declaration, this declaration of the work of Christ, this declaration of his humility, of his crucifixion, and later his exaltation, are provided for us, provided for the readers, as an example of how Christians are to consider others' interest above our own. And the reason is this. Doctrine always leads to devotion. Doctrine always leads to practice. Theology, right theology, life-transforming theology always leads to practice. It leads to a life living out those truths. And so the truth of God always leads to action, which is what Paul puts forth here in these two verses that we're going to consider today. The truth about Jesus Christ leads to a spiritual walk, a spiritual work, excuse me, his followers are called to pursue, that we're called to work out, that we're called to live. And so Jesus showed the course of humility. Jesus showed the course of obedience, as we saw in 1 through 11. Therefore, the Christian, those redeemed by grace through faith, are called to work out his or her salvation with fear and trembling. And so these verses that we're considering today are what we often refer to as sanctification. This, this term, sanctification, you just heard me pray it, sanctification. If you didn't grow up in or around church, the word sanctification may not be something that you're familiar with. It's probably not something that you've heard very often. Or maybe you have engaged in church. Maybe you have been a part of the life of the church for some time, and you're familiar with the word sanctification because we throw it around like everybody's familiar with it, even though it's not really a word we use all the time. And so you're familiar with it, but not quite sure what sanctification means. Well, ultimately, sanctification is the lifelong obedience of believers. It's the life of a believer. It's lifelong obedience, the lifelong obedience of believers. It is obedience to Christ that leads us to grow in Christ's likeness. 
It's the obedience to the Word of God that leads you and I to grow in Christ's likeness. It is spiritual progression. It is not remaining an infant in the faith, but progressing in our spiritual journeys and growing up to mature adulthood. It's going from the spiritual milk to the spiritual meat. Learning to crawl. Think about an infant. Think about a baby. This is the language we use. Learning to, to move. Learning to, you know, it's always, I love it when babies start like, like just making noises, you know. They just make noises all the time. It's, 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 it's so soothing, isn't it? It's just so soothing. We're not having any more babies in my house, but I like the way it sounds, you know. I like the way babies do. But it's learning that, and then it's learning to go from the milk to the, to the, the, the mushy food that real smells funky, but we feed it to kids, you know. It's like, and then it's moving and crawling and walking and then all the way to mature, mature adulthood where they can stand on their own two feet, make their own decisions, discern the truth of God and all of these things. And so it's going from the spiritual milk to the spiritual meat. It's developing spiritual maturity as we love and follow Jesus. And so sanctification is about living in light of the grace of the gospel, living out our new identity in Christ and following scripture. That's sanctification. And this is what these verses encompass. And so with this in mind, I want to make a couple of observations today. First, the Christian call to work out. The Christian call to work out. We see this in verse 12. Paul says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, as we look at this verse, as we begin, I think it's important to note that I initially put in my manuscript one of my dad jokes about God calling the Christian to join, join a gym to work out, get it? Join a spin class, you get it? But the same response you're giving me right now is the response you would have given me if I put it in there, so I left it out. So you're welcome, all right? I typed it in, it wasn't funny. Nonetheless, as indicated already, Christians have been called to a life of work. We've been called to pursue holiness. We've been called to pursue righteousness. We've been called to pursue Christ in all things and in all areas of our lives. You see, what happens is we are all so prone, if we're honest, all so prone to compartmentalize our lives to where we take our Christian lives, we put it in this little box. We have our Christian little box here that we pick up and put down whenever we need it, that we pick up and put down whenever we're going to Utilize it when it comes to Sundays or maybe it comes to Wednesdays. We Wednesdays we pick up that Christian box and hey We've got our Christian life here. We're at church. We're doing the Christian thing We've got our little box and then we put it back on the shelf where it belongs on Monday mornings And then Sunday comes back around we pick up that box. Hey, I'm a Christian today Praise God one day a week. We love you and then we take that box and we put it right back on the shelf however, what we see Paul indicating in this passage is it because you and I are saved by grace through faith in Christ, because we have been gifted salvation, because we are born again, because we are saved, because God has redeemed us, we now have his power at work within us. And because of this, we are to express our salvation in the way that we live every single day. It's not a compartmentalized box. It's everything operates under Christianity because that's who we are. Our identity is now in Christ. It's not in anything this world has to offer. It's not in our jobs. It's not in our families. It's not in any of these things. Our identity is in Christ. And so that identity characterizes everything we do. We work. We are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so Paul begins by commending the Philippians for their continued obedience in the faith. You see, the Philippian church obeyed the words of Paul and his instruction, both in his presence and in his absence. And Paul encourages them for their faithfulness and then exhorts them to continue loving and following Jesus. Now, Paul demonstrates this encouragement before exhortation or before instruction, something I find very helpful. It's always, it's always better and, and, and received much more uh, uh, very well if you encourage someone before you instruct them. Encourage them for their faith, Paul does, and then he instructs them to work out their own salvation. Now, there might be a few misconceptions about the Christian life that we need to take off the table at this point. Some I've already touched upon, but I'll mention again. First, Paul does not say 
Because you have now been justified before God because of your salvation, now you passively coast along in your spiritual journey. This is not true salvation. I've already made that point as true salvation progresses through the years. Second, Paul is not saying work for your salvation. He's saying work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying work for your salvation. You see, we do not work in order to gain our salvation. There is nothing you can do in your own strength, as we'll see in a moment, to please God. Nothing you can do that God looks at and says that is good, apart from his work in you. Good works cannot gain salvation. God freely gives us salvation. Then we work. God freely gives us salvation by grace, grace through faith in Christ. Then we work. We don't work to gain salvation. We work because of salvation. We see what God has saved us from, and then we know what God has saved us to, a life of working for him. Further, Paul also does not say that we are to pursue a life of obedience in our own strength. And then if you continue to fail, then you just aren't strong enough. You're just not strong enough of a Christian. Paul says that we work out our salvation because God is at work within us, because no one can work his salvation out unless God has already worked in it. But it is certainly a long process of obedience. Once more, we'll see more on that in just a moment. So think about it this way. Working out your salvation, being saved. Now what do we do? We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And then we're called to work out our salvation. Think about it this way. When you and I, when a man or a woman first comes to Christ, when we're saved, when we yield to the truths of the gospel, they're not much different than they were moments before they believed in Christ. Think about it. When we first come to Christ, we still have however many years of thinking before that. However many years of developing a worldview, however many years of, of life on our own, if you will, before we come to Christ. Think about that. When we first come to Christ, our worldviews are usually exactly the same. We still have the same problems that we had before coming to Christ. We still have the same misconceptions we had before coming to Christ. We often have the same sins we had before we came to Christ. We sometimes have the same doubts we had as we come to Christ. But after we come to Christ, after we're born again, it then dawns on us as we have been given the spirit of the living God that is at work within us, it dawns on us that many of these things need to change. We come to Christ and we look at our life and go, whoa, that doesn't line up with God's word. Or we look at our worldviews and go, oh, that doesn't line up with God's word. The way I think about this doesn't line up with God's word. And we start to have that transition, that spiritual growth, that spiritual transition within us because we have the Holy Spirit within our hearts and we can respond to the work of the Spirit within us and we begin to see that the salvation we have must now express itself in action. After coming to Christ, we will not remain the same. Scripture doesn't say you're born again and then you remain the same as you were before coming to Christ. It's a progress. It's a progression. The Spirit begins to reveal those things. We grow. We progress in the faith. We will not remain the same. And it must be seen distinctly in our conduct as we work out our salvation, as God grows us. We don't remain the same. We don't stay in that life that we had. But it doesn't just happen all of a sudden overnight. You see, we fall into the trap of people come to Christ, and then we expect them to act like Billy Graham all of a sudden. We expect their moral character and conduct just to change, just like that all of a sudden. But it's a progressive work of the Holy Spirit within someone that grows them and molds them and brings them along. A lifelong progression. Sanctification is lifelong. But here's what we need to know. Growing in godliness is not about achieving a certain status, nor is it about quick results. You see, we live in a life full of shortcuts. I love a good shortcut, all right? I love going from A to B, and if you can take me around the middle or wherever else, it doesn't matter. You give me a shortcut, and I'm on it. You know, we like, we like instant gratification. But as it relates to working out our salvation with fear and trembling and progressing in our Christian walk, there are no shortcuts. We know that very well. There are no shortcuts to go from A to B in our Christian journey. There's no shortcuts on this walk. It's a marathon, not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a long journey, not a sprint. Look, we can name numerous, numerous spiritual giants who are way more mature than us in our faith. 
We all can. We know people that have been influential in our lives that, are, that we would say, man, that is what the picture of godliness looks like. We see them through the years, and they get older, and they've progressed, and we see how strong they are. Maybe it's a grandparent or something like that, and you come along later in life, and you look at your grandparents, you go, they are so strong in their faith. They are rock solid, man. They are mature. They are, they are what I want to be. I look at them, and that's what I want to be in my Christian journey. I want to be where they are. they got rock solid faith. But that didn't happen overnight. That didn't happen overnight. They weren't born again, and all of a sudden, that's who they are. It didn't happen overnight. It happens through years of walking with Jesus. It happens through years of obedience to Christ. It happens through years of suffering, of pain, of hardship. You see, following Jesus requires you and I to take up our cross daily, Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We work out our salvation both privately and corporately by dying to ourselves daily and living to Christ daily, following Christ daily, obediently trusting Christ daily. And this passage also has a corporate aspect as Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Working out your salvation is a call to unity, a call to harmony within the church. We work out our salvation with brothers and sisters that are like-minded working on our salvation daily. But what does it mean to do this with fear and trembling? With fear and trembling, you know? Halloween's coming up, and so all of these Halloween movies are about to come out, and they want you to be scared and fear and fear and fear. And we often think of fear as this, well, I'm scared, a scared type thing. Like, I don't want to go into that dark room because the boogeyman's in there, you know, whatever it might be. But what does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are we supposed to be scared of God, afraid to approach him because we're scared? Thank you, Drew. <laughs> Raising him up in the way in which he should go. Don't be scared of God. He's always got an answer in all things, so there it is. Thanks, buddy. It threw me off. It's good. <laughs> Thanks for saying that in church so all these people can hear it, buddy. You know, they think I'm raising you right, you know. But as it relates to our walk with Christ, how we approach God's Word in our quiet times, in our prayer lives, even our times as we gather here, I think that we often engage in these things and others without an awe of God, an awe of God. We are often lacking in our awe of God. I know I am. You know, I approach the Word, and I don't necessarily approach with fear and trembling. I don't necessarily approach, I mean, if I'm honest with myself, most times in awe of what we're doing here, of what God has given us and what he's shown us about himself and his work through history? Do we approach the Bible with a sense of wonder, with a sense of awe at who God is and what God has done for us through Christ? And so working out our salvation with fear and trembling implies that Christians should live and marvel in awe of God. It's been easy for us the last few days to walk outside and be in awe of God with this beautiful weather we've had, as good as it's felt. It draws us to awe, to marvel at the grace and mercy of God. But as Christians, we should live in humility before God. We should live in submission to His will. And we are to obediently follow Christ through the Word because of who God is. Because we awe at who He is the creator, the sustainer of all things, the one who holds the entire universe in his hands. We do not live terrified of God as he is our refuge and strength, but we live in awe of who he is. As Christians, as his children, we're not afraid of God, but we live in awe of God and his greatness. This is a foundational concept of what it means to be a disciple of Christ of what it means to love and follow Jesus. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. In the Old Testament, God commanded His people to fear Him. Deuteronomy 10.12 And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? All at God and who He is. We fear the Lord and pursue Him reverently as we work out our salvation. That's what Paul says. So the Christian is called to work out. My second observation, we work out because of God, because God works within. We work out because God works within. Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you 
both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, in order to rightly understand what it means to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, it is imperative that you and I understand what enables us to do that. And it's going to get a little deep for a moment, so, so put your thinking caps on. In and of ourselves, we are completely incapable of working out our salvation. In our own strength, we are completely, totally incapable of working out our salvation. We are incapable of following Jesus in our own strength. We will never understand the doctrine of God's working to form our wills until we first realize that apart from the work of God in our hearts through Jesus Christ, we do not have a will that is directed towards spiritual realities. So we can't work out our own salvation. We will act. We will act, you and I, in accordance with our will. We will always choose in accordance with our will, and our wills are naturally inclined towards sin. Our wills are inclined toward sin. We do not have the freedom to pursue these spiritual things because our wills are not naturally inclined toward God. They're naturally inclined toward sin. Paul says in Romans 3, 10 and 11, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And the reason Paul says this is because we are born, all of humanity, we are born dead in our trespasses and sins, which means our wills are inclined towards sin and not toward God. Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. And when Adam sinned, sin entered the world, and all men were born with the same inability to pursue spiritual things apart from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. In the fall, man lost their will inclined toward God, and in exchange received a will inclined toward sin, and only sin. But through Christ... God changes our wills. And so we'll always act in accordance with our will. And apart from the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit within our lives, we would never choose the things of God. So, through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, God changes our wills and inclines them toward the things of God. Through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, God gives us a new heart, inclining our wills toward the things of God. We love because he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19 tells us. We can only come to God because God enables us to do so. If we come to God, it is only because God first entered into our lives by his Spirit, opening our eyes to his truth and drawing us irresistibly to himself. That's what we celebrated this morning through baptism. In doing so, he changes our wills, and God inclines them toward him so that we will work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because God is at work within us, Paul says, we can work out our salvation. Because we've been given a will in accordance with God's will to will and work for his good pleasure. Our will has now been directed toward the things of God, and we can work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But the point of all of this is that we only work because God has worked and because God is working within us. We work because of what God has done. We work because God is working within us. Apart from God, the work of God within us, we have no salvation and never would have salvation. And we certainly would not pursue God and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It is by God's power working in us that enables us to follow him. That's how great God is. We cannot follow him in our own strength. 
Paul says. We cannot pursue him in our own strength. We cannot repent in our own strength. We cannot understand scripture in our own strength. We cannot pray in our own strength. We cannot obey God in our own strength. We are only able to do these things because God is working in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's all of God. Your salvation and your Christian life and your work is all of God working in us for his good pleasure. The Christian life in which we work out our salvation is one lived through the power of God within as he operates through a recreated will, inclined not towards sin but toward him. And the same God that works in you to will now also works in you and through you, through that will, to do his good pleasure. It's amazing. It's amazing. All of God. Our salvation and our lives are all of God. You see, part of the problem within our Christian lives is that we try to will and to work for God in our own strength. We try to do this. So we say, I did that. I did that. I did that. And when we try to do that in our own strength, guess who gets the credit? It's not God. It's man. We try to do this for God, we try to do that for God, and we seemingly push aside the power of God to do these things through us, and eventually we burn ourselves out because we're lousy gods and we will fail ourselves. But how about this? Instead of trying so hard, why don't we just trust God to work in us for his good pleasure? Instead of doing 50 things for Christ in our own strength, let's work out our salvation with fear and trembling and rely upon the power of God within us to sustain us and work through us for the glory of God and the furtherance of His kingdom. You see, the reality is this. This is all of grace. The reality is this. God is never satisfied with any good that comes out of man. He is satisfied and pleased with the good that is done by Christians through the power of Jesus Christ within them to will and to work for his good pleasure. Through the power, through that power, the tyranny of sin is broken. The possibility of choosing for God is restored and a new life of communion with God and holiness is set before the Christian. It is God who works in us to lead us to holiness, not us who leads us to holiness, to will and to work within us for his good pleasure. And that's what's so good about it. God takes pleasure working in us by his power. It brings him pleasure to work in us. The power of Christ within is a wonderful reality for us as Christians. We boast not in man, but we boast in God. In Him, we have all things, and we are enabled to work out our salvation. It's an amazing concept. So all of this talk about working out our salvation with fear and trembling, but what does that look like? We've heard this our whole lives. I've heard this, but I don't know that I've ever heard, like, what does that look like to work out your salvation for, for, uh, for, with fear and trembling? What does that look like on the day-to-day? -day? What does that look like to work it out? on the day today. Well, first, I'm going to give you some practical ways that this uh, happens in our everyday life. First, and I just said this, it means relying on the power of God within you. Relying on the power of God within you. The Spirit of the living God, if you've been redeemed and born again, resides within you, and the power of God works through you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. We must rely on that power, His strength, His power within us. It is acknowledging the reality that apart from God's work in you, you are unable to work for him. And so we work through the power of God. Second, it means being in the word. It means reading scripture, being in the word, being in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God which is at work in you believers. The Word of God, the Bible, is what God uses to instill within us His divine power. He uses His Word. 
This is what we ask for on Sunday mornings as the word is proclaimed, that he would use that word to instill within us divine power. And the same word that spoke the universe into, it, into being is released in our own lives. The same word. We have the responsibility to appreciate that word as Christians. We have the responsibility of recognizing, recognizing that word as authoritative, as infallible. We receive it the word and then we apply it the word of God works in us and through us and when we trust God's word and act upon God's word then God's power is made evident within us as Christians third working out your salvation means being in prayer the word and prayer being in prayer if we want God's power working in us we must spend time daily daily with the word of God and we must also pray Ephesians 3:20 Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us You see the Holy Spirit is closely related to the practice of prayer in our lives and as Christians if we want God to work within us we must be taking time to pray whatever that looks like it looks different for all of us some people have more time that they can spend in, 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 in quiet prayer. Others are, are praying here and praying there and praying driving down the road and praying at work, whatever. Whatever that looks like for us. And it is different for all of us. We must be taking time to pray, not only to ask God of things, not only to ask that God do great things, but just to commune with Him and to praise Him for who He is. To conversate with the Creator through the power of the Holy Spirit. Fourth, it means regularly gathering with the church. You see, Paul is writing to a church, and all of his instruction thus far has been directed at Christians living in relationship with each other. We engage with one another. We work out our salvation by serving each other. We've seen that all the way up to this point. To consider others' interests above our own. To spur one another on to love and good works, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Fifth, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling through suffering. Suffering. This life is a life filled with suffering. Some of us are suffering now. Some have suffered greatly in the past. A lot of suffering may await some of us in our future. We have or will experience suffering in this life, and it comes with the territory of living in fallen creation. And the Spirit of God works in a special way in the lives of those who suffer for the glory of Christ, for the glory of God. That's our study on Wednesday nights right now in our adult Bible study. We're studying what it looks like to suffer for the glory of God. We know that God used suffering in Paul's life for the glory of Christ. Think about Acts 16, Philippian jailer. These fiery trials we face are drawing out impurities within us, and God uses them to mold us more into the image of Christ. 1 Peter 1 is very clear. These are the tools that God has graced us with to enable us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling as the people of God. And you and I, we've been saved from the wrath of God through Jesus Christ, dying on the cross as our substitute so that we, when we repent and believe in Christ, we are, we are adopted into the family of God by the work of His Spirit within our lives. And since we've been saved from the wrath of God, we've been saved to a life of working for God of serving God. Ephesians 2.10, very clear. We're to have a submissive mind, which gives us a joy beyond our understanding as God imparts, imparts us with His power to will and to work for His good pleasure. And my question for you, and my question for me this morning, Christian, is will you work? Will you work? Will you put in the work to progress in your relationship with Christ? As we engage these tools, I can assure you the Spirit of God will work in us to mold us more and more into the image of Christ. Will you work? Is the gospel worth your time to work out your salvation? You see, God's not called you, God's not called me to be a spiritual infant. And He's not called us to sit on the sidelines. He saved us for something, from something, and He saved us to something. He saved us from the wrath of God, and He saved us to a life of sanctification as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Will you work? Pray with me.